Konnichiwa. Welcome to the Jandals in Japan podcast. Hey, Catherine, how's it going? Hi, Jane, how are you? How's your golden week going? I'm actually having a very relaxing golden week. I thought I was going to put my family in the car and drive 1,000 kilometers to the parents-in-law's house at the other end of Japan, cool. but I got tired thinking about it and gave up that idea. And so we stayed home. It's been terrible weather, though. It's not been very mm-hmm. good. It's pouring with rain outside. Not good. And... That is kind of what I need. I think I need a little bit of quiet, sort of time, snuggly blankets and, and hot pots and things, <laughs> just relaxing. Blankets time. from Jackie, yeah? Yeah, <laughs> right. So I'm keeping my, yeah, getting my woolies back out again from Jackie and using them. Mm. And yeah, some nice warm hot pots and a few sparkling beverages. Oh. Yes. How about you? What are you up to this golden week well i'm actually using it as a workation so i'm trying to do some remodeling of some of the business things that i'm on such as my website i'm looking to try and touch that up a little bit Uh, i'm just keeping a low profile i went did some golf practice yesterday i can feel it uh, in my body (laughs) i'm also you know just doing some cooking today because i love cooking on a, a rainy day it's really rainy and Golden Week normally is well known for its jolly good weather, but not this year. Mm. Um, Golden Week holidays are a series of four holidays, basically, in Japan at the end of April and the beginning of May. Apparently, Golden Week dates back to 1948, Jane. Why is that? Well, the Japanese value this time of year. It's like Oshogatsu, the beginning of the year, and Obon in the middle of summer. But people choose this, obviously, to go on holidays and visit their family and friends. The term Golden Week was apparently taken from a movie, well, Mm. from movie companies, whereby they promoted that it was a golden opportunity to see the movies during this particular series of holidays. And then it became common for individuals to refer to this week of the holidays as golden. Mm. So the 29th of April is Showa Day, the Emperor Hirohito's birthday, the 3rd of May is Constitution Day, the 4th of May is Greenery Day, I think that's based on Hirohito's love of plants, hence it's Mm -hmm. green. And then May the 5th is Children's Day. Right. Yeah. So I've sort of wondered about the origin of Golden Week. Thank you for answering that. (laughs) I didn't actually know. It is kind of random. It is kind of random, right, that it became that. So then there's this other holiday period in uh, November, isn't it? September. 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 Mm. Silver Week. Silver Week. I don't think that was a silver opportunity to see movies but yeah but yeah it's not quite as good as golden week Mm. but it can be in some years yeah a a really nice opportunity to have a long couple of long weekends etc yes but for this golden week if you did take from the 29th off you would have basically 10 days although two days are working days most Mm. people are taking that off so it's really nice just to relax take take stock uh, enjoy the weather if it comes back to us. Mm. Think about also having, you know, drinks with your friends and, and keeping a, a social calendar as well. And that's why it's such a good day today to talk about our episode, who is yes. <gasps> very much around beverages. Matt and Guy Hobson are coming to us right now, and they are the two co-founders of Native Sparkling, which is a beautiful non-carb, low sugar, low alcohol. Low, low sugar, low carb. Yeah, low alcohol, <laughs> low alcohol be- yeah. beverage, right? That's coming through, and it is in Japan. They've been in Japan for a while, but they've really just had their first visit as a t- a duo to come through and uh, meet with their suppliers, meet with their distributor, meet with the, the the folks at NZTE who've been looking after them. They sound like they've had a really great time, and we really hope that everyone enjoys this episode. Yeah, so here they are. Let's let's get the boys on. Yay! <laughs> Let's go. Kia ora, Matt and Guy. Hi, Jane. Hi, Catherine. How are you? Hey, guys. Konnichiwa and welcome, <laughs> welcome, welcome. We're so glad to have you guys here. Thank you. Yes. Um, no, it's amazing to be, be on here um, and, and great to connect again, seeing we meet each other in Tokyo as well. Yeah. Well, we know, we know you're in Japan. What whereabouts are you? Fukuoka, down a little bit south today. Uh, so we've been here for three days yeah. i think um we've also a trip to nagasaki mm. uh, but we're here for golden week so last last week for us excellent so we've got a bit of a warm-up question for you a or b 
I'm not sure if you're going to answer this. You will see see how you go. Okay. Tokyo or Osaka? Which Osaka. are you? Which are you? I would say Osaka. Osaka. Ooh. Ooh. Why is that? More, probably suits our style, though, <laughs> a little bit more casual. More calm. More calm, more casual. Interesting to see suits and ties being worn on a Saturday and Sunday for us Kiwis um, in, in Tokyo. So nice in Osaka to see a little bit more of a relaxed atmosphere. Mm. Ah, did you get a different vibe down there? Yeah, we did. I think uh, mainly just when walking amongst the kind of community and walking around the streets, um, it just it maybe probably more youthful vibe as well. But yeah, certainly love Osaka and the person that's been traveling with us, uh, Shiori-san from our distributor, it's where she's from as well. So a lot of excitement to show us her home, her home city. Ah, should we have to show you a good time down there? Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Catherine? Osaka? Because you've lived in both places, right? I've lived and I lived in Osaka for four years while I was working for Panasonic full time down there. And so I got to know Osaka dialect quite well and just really enjoyed how frank people are. Mm. You know, they will tell you something or they'll ask you a straight question. And in Tokyo, they can be a little bit round the bend, don't quite directly ask you something. But Osaka right in there, which (laughs) once you get used to, is totally fine at the beginning i was a little bit what how come you're asking me all these things right but i kind of like that frankness and i've got friends i met there who i are really still my friends right now and when i travel to kansai i sort of feel like okari nasai you know i'm back there yeah so i really like osaka right that's three wow. votes jane okay. yeah i'm i'm kind of torn i do like the sort of orderliness of Tokyo and I remember my first visit to Osaka and being like am I still in Japan is this because up here in Tohoku people are pretty reserved it's pretty pretty quiet pretty Mm. you know people are pretty sort of yeah shy when you get to Osaka it's very in your face and it's like especially if you go there with your children we set a timer when we get off the plane how many minutes does it take before somebody offers us a candy or offers our kids a piece of candy. It's not long. It's about, <laughs> usually it's like 10 minutes before someone says, would you like a Amichan? Amichan. That's, that's good for candy. bribing though. <laughs> <laughs> hey, did you notice any accent or d- differences there? Did anyone teach you anything that was Osaka dialect or Kansai dialect? No, uh, unfortunately not. We, um, we were limited on our own Japanese, so maybe not fully understanding <laughs> the difference in the accent yet, but. Uh, it wasn't something that we picked up, but interesting yeah, to hear. Yeah, there's quite a few things like thank you as all kini instead of arigato and oh, okay. all kini. You may have heard it. It's sort of a little bit different when you hear that you're going out of the restaurant and they'll say, my the all kini, or getting out of the taxi rather than arigato gozaimashita. Yeah, you know, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so it's maybe a we're, bit more we're too loud, maybe from that nice perspective with our arigato gozaimashita. <laughs> No, it's nice. They would have thought, oh, those guys have got textbook Japanese. How lovely. Yeah. We've just been using Google Translator. <laughs> oh, good on you. Yeah. I mean, I love Osaka, but I also really love Tokyo. So I'm sort of in both camps. So what is that? Is that two and a half versus one and a half? I'm going to mm. put, yeah, I'm pretty torn, actually. I can't. Yeah, but you have to choose one. That, that's It's got to be okay. A or B. Yeah. Okay. I will go for Osaka this time. I'll go for Osaka too. Go for Osaka. And Glenn, I'm sure, will be listening yeah. in and uh, he'll like us saying that too. Yeah, big <laughs> shout out to Glenn who's made this, actually made this all possible by letting us know that you guys were coming mm-hmm. and inviting us to come, actually to come all the way down to Osaka and meet you guys down there. And we were like, yeah, yeah, we'll come. We're up for anything. And then we're like, yeah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so we're so glad to see both of you brothers matt and guy hobson who are you know the equivalent of the zespri has the kiwi brothers you guys are definitely the native sparkling brothers and we are so glad that you came through got your visas and were able to come to japan it's really really amazing we've been totally waiting for this to get you on and and record with you today we hunted you down on the internet after glenn introduced us <laughs> you know we met you at the conrad and yeah. in, in tokyo and yes that was very formal and you had your suits on and you you had your yeah. logoed masks you know with your branding on there and everything and we've just been so really happy and pleased to watch you all the way through japan and everything you've been doing it's just been amazing and i think you're really an inspiration for other kiwi businesses who want to come and visit and travel through Japan. And so we really just wanted you to come on, share your insights, especially since they're fresh and sparkling right now. And so we wanted to say again, welcome, Matt and Guy, to the show. Thank you. Yeah, really appreciate it. And very nice to be be here with you both today. 
and share yeah, some of what we've learned. And nice to still be in Japan as well yeah, while we talk to you. Um, that's right. So people will get to know, because I'll just hear your voices, so that was just Guy speaking now. Oh, yeah. We're going to sound quite the same. So I'm the younger brother um, and Matt, the older and brother. I'm the older brother. So there you go. Is it Ototo? Ototo. <laughs> younger brother. He's Ototo and you're yeah. Ani, and the older right? Brother. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Onisan. So we're going to be putting your full bios into the show notes as much as you'll let us put in there. For the meantime, though, tell us about your inspiration for setting up Native Sparkling. You told us a little bit at the Conrad. I, I loved that story. Jane and I both mm. did. And we'd just love to hear it again. You could have chosen anywhere else to sort of send your product. And here it is in Japan. And we've both had the pleasure of trying it. So tell us what got you going, the whole story with your family and, and getting into business together. Yeah, so we... We launched Native officially out of the back of Matt's truck in June 2019. I mm. think I mentioned to you, Catherine, our first customer was the Bottle O in Nine Nine, a small place uh, in oh, Wellington. Lovely. And um, so it's in June will be four years, but I guess most of our experience in business has been with the pandemic. So it's been a little bit unique in that regard. Mm. But the concept for an alcohol brand was um, originally when we all returned from our OEs, we had a, a recipe book. From our university days, Matt and another one of our co-founders, Luke, and essentially we dusted that off and we saw hard seltzers in the US, which was focused on low sugar, low carb, low calorie alcoholic beverages um, and a little bit lower in alcohol as well, and thought we could maybe Kiwify that version and create what we believe a hard seltzer would be from a New Zealand perspective. Um, and also use flavors such as kiwi fruit and feed jar as a way of kind of moving away from the mainstream perspective of flavor profiles. And then part of our foundation before we launched as well was to really emphasize the environment and conservation story. So we are a family team that started it and Luke's a really good family friend. Um, we come from a rural farm in north of Fielding in the Manawatu. So we're used to you know, the positives of what the environment brings uh, and so wanted to create a, an alcohol brand that just made it really easy for people to support conservation. So it'd be a bridge for people to be able to support conservation and the fact that 80% of Kiwi adults drink on a weekly basis uh, made it kind of a unique product to essentially replace, uh, well, not replace a habit, but just switch in one product or another with that one doing um, more better for the for the planet. And so that's where Native was born. It's where the name comes from with Native Species. In terms of Japan, one of our flavour profiles is Yuzu, which is our number one flavour in New Zealand as well. And we built a really good, well, Matt built a really good relationship with our Yuzu uh, partner. And that kind of one thing led to an, another and introduced us to a distribution and importation partner as well. And so it was really the flavor profile that led us to Japan. Um, we started the business or having a goal of the business to take the best of New Zealand to the world. So we knew we had exporting ambitions from the start. And so Japan kind of came out of that journey or process of wanting to be an exporting company. Uh, and since then, yeah, it's been amazing to come up here finally after being in the market for eight or nine months now and to finally visit our distributors and, and see Native on the shelf. Um, so it's been a quick fire four years, although we've had plenty of ups and downs as you do in, in business, but amazing to be here and actually buy your own product off the shelf and, and share it with people. It's interesting that you are, I think you mentioned the biggest importer of yuzu in New Zealand. Yes. And yeah. you import the yuzu to New Zealand, make it into drinks, and then send it back to Japan, right? Yes, so we that's do. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us about setting up. How did you get into business with this Japanese company that sends the yuzu to you? How did um, that happen? Did you Google Matt, it or get the yellow pages out? And what did you do? <laughs> um, trying to cut out the middleman, maybe. <laughs> so, uh, was just sort of looking at, at getting some efficiencies and, and uh, reducing some of the costs. So I reached out to the the direct supplier here and he had some good English and we were able to have some fairly good communication around some of the the opportunities perhaps of uh, exploring the Japanese market so he was able to send obviously some some yuzu down to me and I said well why don't we send some of our product back to you to sample and the yuzu yuzu farm is is related or in business with our distributor so that sort of joins that dots uh, those dots and from there, we've managed to support our distributor uh, and, and obviously get on the shelf here in, in Japan. Was that like a serendipitous thing that they just happened to have? Or was it just like, I'm looking for a yuzu farm that has a distributor? That has a <laughs> We'd love to say it was a strategic approach, but no, I think I wouldn't say it was luck. It was 
two years of, of buying a lot of yuzu from right. um, this farm as well. So a lot of, I guess, money has been spent on on real real fruit. It's a big, unique difference of our product rather than using natural flavors. And behind the scenes, maybe we didn't acknowledge this at the start, but we do now that that probably gave us a lot of credibility in the market that this person in New Zealand was buying a lot of yuzu and continuously building a relationship with them. So it meant that we could probably jump through to a distributor mm. quite quickly rather than having to kind of come in from the side door and just organically make our way to the top. So a bit of luck, but also um, a lot of costs and expense, but um, paying off now for holding to our value of using real fruit and then um, going to natural flavours because that's a lot cheaper, obviously, to produce that way. And you tried it when you were there, did you, when you went and actually visited the farm and, and met the pers- people who are growing it? Did you actually get a chance there to, st- whether it was in cold store or it wouldn't have been on the trees right now, I don't think. So did you get to sample anything down there? No. So the uh, we went to the manufacturing and packaging aspect of, of that right. business, but right. haven't been able to visit the farm, but we've certainly mm-hmm. um, circled it on the map for the next trip. Good. A lot to do with the story as well, in terms of showing what actually is in our drink and the story from the orchard to the can. Uh, so it's something that we have penciled for the next time we're here. And then the harvest is in uh, is it November or mm. October, mm. November. Mm. So mm. we might uh, sneak another trip in before that, perhaps. How do you describe Yuzu to people? I mean, maybe people are getting used to it now as Yuzu is a, is a thing like Nushi, or well, Nushi pears used to be. What do you call it? How do you describe this particular fruit? We, uh, it's our most um, frequently asked question. So we get mm. it a lot. We wanted to build a merchandise um, thing with what is user on the front and <laughs> the description on the back. So when we're serving drinks, we just, people can see what they're around. Yeah. We, we call it a cross between a, a mandarin and a grapefruit. So it, it looks like a large lemon or a large um, grapefruit but uh, a very nice citru- a rounded citrus taste. Um, so not as quite as harsh or as acidic as lemon, but a lot more flavorful. And we, maybe in New Zealand, the palate isn't as well adjusted to the yuzu flavor, but certainly in Japan, we've, we've been sampling with uh, buyers. They certainly can acknowledge that we have a lot of yuzu in the drink. Um, so it's well accustomed to here. And what about the other side of it? Fijoa, Fijoa, Fijoa. I'm a Kiwi, I know, but I'm a South Islander. And so I have to admit... I haven't had a lot of pijoas in my lifetime. However, uh, you, sh- you should have more. I have had more, but I tell you what: out of all of your samplings, your yuzu, lemon, kiwi fruit and lime, yeah. and apple and fijoa, I thought that would be the drink that I didn't like the mo- most, and I loved it the most. Mm. I really loved that one. So, how do you describe that fruit to Japanese or to mm. someone like me, who's <laughs> uh. been in Japan a long time and almost can't remember what one tastes like? <laughs> it's interesting because uh, we've been trying to answer that question in the last week or so and mm. trying to relate what we know it is in New Zealand mm. perspective and, and mm. that's mostly because we know the fruit but we've been trying to link it to a Japanese fruit we haven't quite successfully done that yet but we thought the lemon and yuzu would be the most popular flavour in Japan for our range of products here uh, but apple and fijo is now creeping up to number one mm. and I think there's a little bit of so nice. Obviously, people know Apple, but there's a little bit of trial. Um, and once they've tried it and the return on investment's really high, if they want, someone's once they've cracked the can, they go, this is oishi, delicious. And um, so we're seeing that the sales numbers for Apple Fijo are jump up. But we still haven't quite figured out how to educate the consumer on what, what it really is. is. Is there a similar fruit to a, a Japanese fruit for Fijo? I have come across one in Japan like it. But no. I was actually having this discussion with some people the other day who I gave you a drink to, and they're like, what, what's a Fijo? And I'm like, um, it's kind of like a cross with a banana. It's got a banana-y kind of taste to it, but it's kind of tangy as well, and it's mm. a bit gritty and a bit sort of gu- like guava in the middle. And, yeah. and yeah. you scoop it out with a spoon, and they were just like, they're, they're, yeah, they couldn't. Yeah, well, we, might, we might use that, Jane. <laughs> that's, that's super, it, super eloquent you know, description. It, it kind of reminds me like a tamarillo as well, the shape and that it's mm-hmm. sort of approaching that, but it's not because the color's completely wrong. Mm-hmm. And Jane's right with the banana thing, but it doesn't mm-hmm. look like a banana. So it's, it's <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a tricky one, that one. But maybe it's sort of kiwi fruity banana. Mm-hmm. Yeah, would you say kind of one, between yeah. a yeah. sort of a mix of kiwi fruit and banana tanginess, and, and you eat yeah. it the same way, and it looks kind of similar. 
We yeah. actually grow them here. They actually grow them here oh, where I, I live uh, yeah. in uh, Fukushima and Iwaki. Mm-hmm. There's a, but they sell them for like one for like, you know, like $5 or something, you know, for one. Wow. Thing. But yeah, they do grow them. They're starting to be growing in Japan. So, you know, in another five years, maybe they will be a more well-known fruit. Who knows? Um, because they are being grown. Be, that will be very helpful for us as well. Yeah. More recognizable. <laughs> the other yeah. thing is the hard sparkling, uh, the hard seltzer thing that's in America and, and not so recognized here. And I guess Japanese people know a lot about chuhai, and I'm sure you've had a few chuhais while you're here. But chuhai, I don't drink. It's too sweet. Uh, I find it too alcoholic as well. I mean, I think, Jane, you quite like it. I might be wrong there, but I'm not really a big too high drinker. So how have you been using that as a comparison, but saying it's less in alcohol, it's it's got real fruit, it's lower in carbs, lower in sugar. Is that kind of how you've been explaining it as well? Yeah. How have you been doing that? There's two parts. There's some buyers, um, buyers by meaning larger distributor groups that then work with supermarkets, but some buyers who are happy to talk about the category itself of, of hard seltzer and establishing that. Um, so we can speak to them around what that neutral sugar cane base is and what some of the original recipes out of the US were. Um, ideally, kind of alcoholic sparkling water where you're not really supposed to taste in vodka or gin profile. It's right neutral in the middle when you only taste the real fruit aspect. And that's the clean and simplicity that we mimic in New Zealand and obviously Kiwi fight it with our flavours. But we, we mainly at the moment are using the lifestyle aspect or where the kind of consumers shifting towards uh, low sugar, low carb, matching their food diet in terms of being conscious around what they eat and also applying that to the end of the week when you do consume a bit of alcohol. So mm-hmm. our main approach at the moment is more around a shift in, in all consumers, but also mainly in that millennial kind of group as well around being very conscious about what you consume. Previously, that alcohol was kind of your guilt-free option at the end of the week and you didn't really mind what was in it. But now we're seeing a really strong kind of cognition of, of people understanding what really in their drink and wanting to know where it's come from, is it real or not? Um, and that's where we kind of position native mm-hmm. at the moment. Trying to keep a, uh, a premium element to the brand. So perhaps two highs, probably a bit more mainstream, uh, yeah. higher percentage of alcohol as well, whereas we are... are, are trying to say more premium with our values and, and at 4.6% as is, is I suppose accommodates to a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of people in Japan who can't hold their alcohol very well. Like that <laughs> 4.6 is plenty for mm-hmm. a lot of people. And yeah, they probably appreciate the low carb, the, you know, the mm-hmm. natural fruit, et cetera, and all the things as well. And hard, hard spark like this, um, what's it called? Kyo Tansang, isn't it? Mm. Catherine, the very, very strong, very strong. Um, water with bubbles in it that they sell these days. Yeah. It's very popular at the moment. So yeah, I think you've sort of come at the right time with your hard sparkling mm. as well. It's um, definitely something people are looking for. They're looking for very Kyo Tansang, very strong, yeah, strong, strong yeah. sparkling. Um, and certainly water. when it yeah. pours on the glass, it just that sound when it hits and then you hear that whole effervescent buzz and then it sort of simmers and i think it's something that if i was on a, a nomikai uh online nomikai so a, a drinking party or drinking event online and i had that in my glass no one really know that it wasn't sparkling uh you know alcoholic drink as in mm. like a, a, a champagne or a mm-hmm. sparkling wine so i think it's a really great alternative i was quite thrilled actually that i thought i would just taste alcohol and i didn't but i knew it was so my brain was registering the fruit more than the the alcohol part of it mm. um and i had to crack open too because i thought is this really <laughs> alcohol but uh, it's just so fresh and and lovely and inviting it's really great that you've brought it to japan we really thought There must be some things that have happened in Japan while you've been here, like highlights of your trip or something that surprised you about Japan. Any kind of funny moments that have gone on? Uh, Yes. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Where do we start? (laughs) (laughs) So probably we we had a great night. It was the first time we met all of the sales and marketing team from our distribution partner. And they took us to a box or corporate box to watch the SoftBank Hawks baseball team here in, in Fukuoka. And it was really nice to go through all the formalities of business cards and meeting the team properly and and explaining who we are and attempting some Japanese. Uh, And then kind of continued on with whoever was, I guess, game enough to go out with Matt and I and ended in karaoke. And it was a really long night, but it really cemented kind of a story for us to fall back on. And some of the emails we received the next day were around that, as I hope that established a memory for you to remember kind of the team and 
although it revolved around drinking and having fun, but it was a, a highlight to follow the formality process, but then kind of see the relaxation kind of occur and people just starting the second to, party yeah. yeah the second part <laughs> the first really party the the serious bit and then yeah. the second party the then, second part yeah. of just enjoying yeah. two kiwis being in the room and us enjoying the hospitality of what they put on it for us that night um you probably talk about really? the juices <laughs> <laughs> yeah they uh, they presented us with some of the uh the original softbank hawks game jerseys and signed by the the director so that was a very special moment and of course we had to uh Put them on on top of our uh, on top of our shirts and look very all blend in with the crowd. So now that was a, a really you fun got night. like personalized ones though, didn't you? With like your names your on. Names I saw that. Right, yeah. I was like, yeah. Wow. A, a very well special done. touch. Yeah. Very nice. And a, a, a highlight for me. This is my first time to Japan, so we actually did a bit of a road trip to Mount Fuji, uh, and and got all the way up to the the fifth station uh, and mm. touched some of the snow and, and got some photos with um, a couple of our distributors or, or sales team traveling with us so that was um yeah an, an amazing trip and by the sounds of it not that many japanese actually get to mount fuji so uh really special yeah there's some uh saying that you climb mount fuji once and only a fool climbs it twice so <laughs> you know a fool doesn't climb it at all and only a fool climbs it twice so you've been up there now <laughs> That I'll leave you with that, but <laughs> how memorable! I mean, mm. and that look, view down from there too, and the the lake and everything—it's mm. just amazing, isn't it? That area, yeah, how inspiring! I think you've got a good story though about before you came to Japan. Could you tell us about uh, how Don helped you out? Yeah, uh, so <laughs> it might be something you touch on later as well in terms of some of the things to remember, but we talked to Don Roxburgh who you've had on your show and yeah great great guy and he we decided to talk to him about a week before we came just to ensure we knew what we were getting ourselves into um, and some of the customs around business meetings and the first thing he mentioned was for us to make sure we had our business cards ready which uh, we did not we thought maybe we only needed 100 but we managed I think we printed 250 yeah. and we've got about 40 left so Wow. Um, it was a okay. key point from Don that if we hadn't spoken to him, we would have been scurrying that first week in Tokyo trying to find a printer. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, certainly reach out to the expats before you before you get here and establish what really uh, needs to be done when it comes to the business side of, of meetings and the customs around that. Gosh, you met a lot of people. If you've only got 40 left, that's that's a lot of people you've met over the last yes, it's weeks. Yes, it's been, yeah. been uh, an intense but also really fun two and a half weeks I think this is our last week now and there's I think three or four meetings to go but yeah three weeks and we didn't think we'd get through all the cards but we nearly have mm. what's a really good idea yeah. as you're getting down to your lower end of the deck is to take a photo of both sides of each card and then you can at least yeah. send it by messenger or send it quickly to them mm. on the spot just in case you run out it's always good to have a couple of photos of them Mm. Yeah. No, we'll, we'll do you guys not now, use business cards where you're from? Like they're no. not not used these days in New Zealand. So yes and no. I think mainly from what we have experienced anyway, there's business cards are at the end of the meeting, but by that time you've probably already established a like who do you know type thing in New Zealand, or you went to the school or that school, or mm. yeah, we've connected this way, and mm. it's very simple to get someone's email and ask for just a connection and away you go. Um, and obviously most introductions happen over email before you meet, so you've already got their details. So we haven't really had a need for it. And also part of our sustainability story was to try and reduce printing and reduce paper. Uh, so we've kind of, for conferences and events, try, just chosen not to go with them. But here in Japan, to yeah. meet the customary kind of side of the business aspect, we certainly appreciate why you need it. Also, I think people haven't been able to give them out during COVID-19. We've been at home and not been able to meet with people. So I think people are really keen to actually hand over their business cards right now too. And it's part of their story. And I guess when you meet people, you're telling them your story. And you told us a bit of your story before. When you meet with your your customers, your suppliers, the retailers, how are you telling your story? Is it similar to what you told us now? Or when you tell them, is there something you find them really surprised, their eyes light up or that resonates with them that you keep bringing into your story now as you've been here the last couple of weeks? Yes, a couple of the recent supermarket meetings that we've had, um, it's been really interesting. It's, it's not really ever to do with the numbers or the size of your business or what your aspirations are in terms of you know, product sales and how much you're going to sell off the shelf. It's really about specifically for these introduction type meetings, 
where you come from, who you are, what your story is, what does your family do? Uh, we've even been asked, you know, what did we do before Native? What did we do before that? <laughs> so really trying to understand what, what makes us tick. I think the part that I've been maybe most surprised with is uh, I'm 30 years old and Matt's 32, and I don't know if they see too many younger entrepreneurs in Japan exploring this type of idea of having a business and, and scaling a brand overseas. So not as unique in New Zealand, um, but seems to be quite unique here. So the story that we've been sharing is it's been quite refreshing for Matt and I uh, being out of the New Zealand environment to be here in Japan and, and really be more of ourselves in a way. We've been able to express ourselves and just share where we come from and what we believe in and what our values are and then how they, that therefore represents Native. Um, and Native obviously has its values as well. So yeah, it's been a, a really refreshing experience going into some of those meetings where you feel like they're going to hound you with the questions of how big you are and what's your revenue and you know what are you going to do to market a product and how much you're going to spend with us. So we've, we've kind of been able to not have to go through that process, which has been quite nice. What do they think of the that your family? Like, there's two brothers coming. Did they have any comments about yes, that? Because <laughs> your sister's also involved in the yeah, business yeah. too, isn't she? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So yep. yeah. She's a, um, she was fundamental to our success early on in the business and, um, and getting things moving in New Zealand and is also a shareholder of the company, which is important to us that everyone shares in the, in the success um, of the brand. And what's your um, sister's name? Brooke. Brooke. So shout out to Brooke. Shout out to Brooke. If you're yeah. Brooke. Yeah. She is Brooke. <laughs> Who had to stay and home. Japan. Yeah. And from yes. Japan. She's been up here too in Japan. Uh, we both did a skiing season uh, together up in Nisiko. So um, her Japanese is a lot better than mine. So we really relied on her the last trip we were here to get us around um, but she loves this place too I think she's very jealous that we're up here and now uh, she's I bet. not yeah well, well we look after her next time she comes through yeah <laughs> promise that that's for sure and I mean you've talked a little bit about the conservation side of things I think that's just such a beautiful part of what you're doing I really mean that you know being a for-purpose company and I know that you're on your journey to help a hundred different species in New Zealand I think you call that the hundred club and then you're also yeah. involved in Trees That Count. Tell us about these two amazing endeavours and why that matters to you, that you also support New Zealand's conservation and how also that story has impacted people in Japan when they hear you talk about that. When we had the concept of alcohol, we really wanted to start or have a foundation with the environment and sustainability being a core of the brand before we started the company. A lot you'll see a lot of brands scale and get to a point where they feel it's necessary to kind of tack that onto their brand, which is great to see. We encourage that. Uh, it's obviously better that everyone participates than not. But we really wanted to start with that as our, our purpose, as our story. So our mission is um, to make it as easy as possible for everyday consumers to support conservation. So there's nothing really easier than just cracking a can at the end of the week, knowing that trees are being planted or species are being released. So our 100 Club is supporting 100 individual species from hatch to release. And the importance of that is that we really want to take our, our customers and our followers on a journey of the actual egg, the hatching process and being released into the wild with the GPS so we can track and check in on how Humanawa is an example of Kiwi at Kaha Wildlife Trust is, is tracking. And we're working with Kokako up on Tiritiri Matangi Island. Um, and it's quite an educational journey for us as well. In no way are we fully knowledgeable about the conservation space of New Zealand. So it's, it's nice to be challenge and to go through a process of learning as founders as well mm. in terms of in japan there's probably a slightly different mindset we don't have the marketing budget to to educate people i guess in japan of why this is so important compared to just drinking chew high or, or whiskey highballs or different drinks we've come across so we're more going on a, a journey of um, sharing the sustainability and purposelessness of um, purposelessness of the the orchards the real fruit the story to the can and that's what the consumer, I believe, up here is really looking for, the real fruit aspect, the pure alcohol aspect, the clean charcoal filtered sparkling water that we use. So the flavour profiles that um, go into native, I think, up here is a prominent story from an environmental perspective. I think it's a good tick in the right direction for us to have the part past the can as well, planting trees and supporting species here. So that's something that we're looking to do now with our distributors invest in Japan. Um, so have a Japan conservation arm and a New Zealand conservation arm. Um, really important that the consumers here know that whatever they're doing when it comes to consuming native, the benefits remain in Japan. 
So you mentioned your, your wonderful distributors that you've had connections with. And so I, I imagine you've had a lot of help from them and coming into the market guidance. Would that be right? Or did you have to figure this all out by yourself? How do you feel about that? They, they've been exceptional, really. So we've got, obviously, we're working closely with the NZTE as well. But our distributor has perhaps gained us a bit more access than, than we originally thought. Um, and so they've been really good just to gain some knowledge, the different tiers of distribution as well. And we've, we've dealt with some pretty big corporations and, and having some successful meetings with them. But they've pretty much been able to guide us through that whole process. Uh, and with NZTE, we've got some really good account managers there who have been able to support us in a, a few activations uh, and obviously promoting the New Zealand business and, and culture up here. So they've been uh, yeah, fantastic as well to, to work with and, and hopefully we'll obviously continue on with that relationship um, with some, some uh, NZ Fair events coming up. And obviously mm-hmm. in summer, they'll be active to, to engage with the Japanese and, and uh, New Zealand business community. Awesome. We'll keep our eyes out for those coming through in the summertime. Yeah, your product's going to be perfect for, for summer, right? So Yes. Yeah, okay, so question back to you both is, the seasonal change is something that we've experienced where, for example, we've been wearing sunglasses and we haven't seen many people wearing sunglasses. Mm-hmm. And then we get told on the first of the first day of summer is when you can officially wear sunglasses. But it seems very <laughs> seasonally dominated. Um, is that something you've experienced? Oh, yes. 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 <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. Where do we start about the seasonal? Oh, everything, yeah. right? Um, yeah, everything. And it's so true. You don't do something before the change. So you don't wear short sleeves before it's officially the koromogai, the change of your uniform. closet yeah. uh, uniforms out of winter clothing or into summer clothing or spring yeah. into, you know, going into summer. So it's very distinct where these things happen. I mean, the, any anything that you'll see in the retail, I guess, in supermarkets, we talked a little bit about on a previous episode about chocolate, for example, you know, every single season, there'll be a different fruit or a different flavor that is only in that season. I think mint is one of the ones that mint. just, you'll never see it any other time of year, but mm-hmm. summertime, yeah. mm. right, in Japan, and then it disappears. So if you don't get it, then you miss out for another and year. Yeah. <laughs> and right, lemonade. Right, and, and lemonade. lemonade. Yeah, we can only get like okay. seven Sprite or seven up or something in the summer months because it's a refreshing summer drink. And so, too bad if you want it in winter or something, you just have yeah. to go without. I was yeah, surprised. It's not an yeah. all year drink here. Your drinks are going to be, uh, I'm sure, flying <laughs> on the shelves <laughs> once summer comes along because you, know, we, and, and you yeah, have to come back and experience it. summer. I think yeah. you've been here for winter, mm-hmm. right? And you've experienced spring, but you have not experienced a Japanese summer and that is something else as well. Yes. I mean, we're that. heading into uh, rainy season and as this episode will come out before rainy season officially starts, although it feels a bit rainy season at the moment, mm-hmm. you know, you'll have uh, umbrellas and raincoats and uh, the equivalent of gum boots, rain boots that, you know, it, that all comes out and then it disappears. So you won't get it. Even if it's a slightly rainy summer, you won't see it because it's already changed to summer officially. So it must be summer things <laughs> that you sell. So it's very distinctive on the seasons. Japan loves its seasons. There's lots of poetry written about seasons. Different things happen in the season. So it's really being conscious of that. But with your product, certainly it's a great timing, as Jane said, coming into this summer. Mm. Ah. And have you seen any kind of climate related change to those seasons and being here for a while? Or is it still just the same date every year? (laughs) It does change, doesn't it, in Japan? So Mm. that season of the actual climate's changing, but the official days of the season changing is the same. So Mm. you'll still get on the the train and it's, you know, it's hot outside and they haven't adjusted to summertime air conditioning because it's not officially summer yet. So we must keep Mm. it at that. So it does. Regardless of what's actually um, happening outside. Yeah. 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 Because come on, Japan, it's hot in here. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly. always quite fun. Yeah. 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 Well, I guess too, I wanted to, we wanted to ask you about being Kiwi here and the X factor that's driving your success here. Have you found that that's been a really big thing? You've talked a little bit about it now, um, up till now with your family, but what about the Kiwi side of things? And do you think that really makes a difference, say for other Kiwis coming through here? Should you accentuate the Kiwiness or don't play it up too much? Just be who you are. What do you think about that? Just being yourself. I uh, think. New Zealand obviously has a very small population, so the chances are they haven't met many Kiwis before. Um, There's not a huge amount of exporters from New Zealand to Japan as well. 
So just being yourself is the best thing that we could, uh, for anyone listening, for advice is what we have found really refreshing, as I touched on. Matt and I love meeting people and growing relationships and figuring out what their values are and what our values are. And so that that mindset has really uh, been quite useful in Japan uh, rather than just looking at kind of can we sell three or four more containers while we're up here, which is what mum and dad have been pushing <laughs> us to do. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> hi mom hi dad, <laughs> dad hope you're listening. We, talk, we talk to dad and he's just like so have you made any deals and we're like well yeah. we're growing relationships yeah we're, uh, that's right the deals will come the deals will come long game um, so it's the the kiwi side i guess as well to touch on is um and something to be prepared for is bringing a lot of imagery and photography or videos of, of where you're from we're lucky enough to come from a farm and one of the best videos we have is myself being a few golf balls just up on the farm and saying this is our practice range and they're looking at that and of course if you're in the middle of Tokyo where if you got the sky tree you can't that. see the you can't yeah. see the end of the city that and would be so, magic yeah just little things like that, that we take for granted um that we don't see as as unique and up here if, if you have a range of that that kind of story you can show where you've come from and and it's okay to show that in a meeting we've been in some uh, large meetings with Kokobu Group which is a big um, or the largest alcohol distributor in Japan and we're on our phone showing them which we would seem quite informal but they're just that interested in, in understanding what New Zealand is it's not part of Australia where we're separate showing them the nature and the conservation and the efforts that we put ourselves um, through with native um, and the impact that we're having but also where we've come from. Such an icebreaker to do that I mean, mm, mm. and it yeah. breaks the, uh, the the translation barrier. It sure the does. Imagery is strong. Yeah, mm. I'd be just overwhelmed by that. Their real genuineness would come out too. I mean, that's your farm, and that's where you play golf. Oh my goodness, mm. it would just be it would be flowing, and from there you would have really just cracked the ice on that one. Yeah, yeah. We've, we've used that video probably about eight times, <laughs> I think. and eight times it's been successful. So if you oh, are wow. coming here, mm. make sure you have a bit of a folder on your phone ready of of just some imagery, powerful imagery, but also just storytelling imagery of where you've come from. And they um, they certainly love that. Mm. Yeah, that's an awesome uh, thing to put in the playbook. Yeah, bring some imagery. Anything else for our Japan market entry playbook we've got? Make sure you've got your business cards, business cards. Business cards. imagery. There's three things that Matt and I summarized on this um, and talking just in the last couple of days. And uh, one I've, I've touched on in terms of speaking to as many expats such as yourself and we've reached out before we came and we only did that maybe a week or two before we came because it's quite rushed with getting our business visa but just getting a good lay of the land from the Kiwis that are up here either they're in business or they live here and they just uh, know the culture obviously better than what we would do and, and it's coming through a Kiwi lens as well so that you can understand it a lot easier. In each city, there's Kiwis around and it's great to go out with them and again they show you where the spots are and what you need to know. Besides being up here is obviously one of the key points to, to make is coming to Japan. Some of the just respecting the business customs. So being on time, which in Japan, I think we, as we mentioned to you, being about 20 minutes early, early. Yeah. Really start about 10 minutes before the schedule. Uh, so being early, being on time, presenting yourself well, have the business card custom kind of ready where you switch hands. There's no shaking hands, which is unusual for Kiwis. And just understanding that process because you're going to be um, under pressure at some point to to go through it and have a have a crack at Japanese as well. So we introduce our name and Matt's learnt um, his line around on the younger brother and that kind of cracks a little smile and I think they appreciate that we've we've at least taken the effort to learn some Japanese. Uh, and then the third point was to say yes to any social event. We're I think on day nineteen now of of some late nights, and I think there's a bit of pressure <laughs> being an alcohol brand as well. They're expecting a lot. Yeah, but be, yes. most most of the deals or most of the kind of meaningful conversations happen outside of that kind of boardroom meeting room, and so we've found that just by saying yes, like yep, we'll, we'll go again, we'll go again. That uh, we've had a lot of great conversations that um, have cemented maybe an idea that we thought was proposed in the meeting, but actually having the time and the ability just to have a, a whiskey highball and discuss a little bit more about who we are and if this is actually going to work, all of that's happened outside of the meeting time. So those are our kind of three thoughts that we had around around Japan and what we've learned since being here. That's awesome. I think you mentioned about, you know, finishing off with karaoke and all of that. And so a lot of people don't know that in Japan, the first you will often have the the formal section, mm. which is when you have the business cards and everybody's got their suit on and 
that needs to get done first so that everyone can relax and then have the Nijikai, which is the second party. This, so ni, Nijikai, yeah, ni, yeah? And then if things are going really well, then you'll get the Sanjikai, the third party. And that could be when the, when the, the bow ties are around your head and you're singing oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And then <laughs> for is the there formal, a yun? And a second, or not? It could be, could be. It depends how wild you're a house. Yeah. If you can yeah, find anyone to, to go yogi, with you. I've been to a yogikai before, so I've been to the it's fourth pretty, one. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> pretty wild, right? Yeah. And but you know what? You might not talk about it on Monday, or you might not talk about it. Like, oh man, it was really wild when you jumped off the table and you were singing. Right, right. You, yeah. that, that's what happens at karaoke stays at karaoke, stays at karaoke. Yeah. right? And it's sort of like you know, say, oh Suzuki son, you were really hammered last night. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like, thank you for last night. It was fun. Moving on, you know. Yeah, and, um, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I found that quite difficult to sort of. Because I wanted to say, like, oh, man, it was really fun when you did that last <laughs> night and oh, didn't know you were such a rascal, you know, but um, yeah. no. Not, and often, no. too, they'll take you out, right? You you sort of feel like you're being looked after so much and you haven't done anything. They'll pay That's for right. you as well, right? Mm. Um, unless you're told beforehand that it's a contribution, then you can expect that they are paying for you. But it's always nice to, and I'm sure you've got your usual suitcase full of <laughs> native to give and everything like that but it's nice to have something to give back or to at least write the next day um, mm. as you did when we you met with us in Tokyo I thought it was oh, super you guys wrote the next day or the next day next day to say thanks so much and that was just exactly what you do in Japan you mm. you know you at least say thank you even though you said thank you that night you'll still yeah. follow up with a thank you so I thought that was it's great. The business they cards will, come in handy. Yeah, we become they, big yeah. Japanese businessmen now. <laughs> yeah, they will of, yeah, they will often shout you and it's very hard to know what to do, but you just have to go with that flow. Sometimes yeah. someone will pay the bill. If you already know that you have to contribute, you normally maybe not contribute on the night. Someone will collect up the money the next day, especially if it's mm. like an office function. But you guys seem like you're doing really, really well, especially that turning up early thing is, is, is important too. Yeah, that was a, a big change because in New Zealand, if you're meeting at 3.30, you'll kind of walk right through the cafe door at 3.30 or your time you'll walk. <laughs> exactly. By here, luckily the mm. transport's so efficient and so uh, on time that, yeah, you're, you're scheduling yourself to be there at least 15 to 20 minutes beforehand. What else have you found? Well, what is actually, I guess, trending in your industry, in the beverage industry right now? What have you seen uh, in Japan that you didn't really expect to see in the beverage industry? Some of the, I suppose, similarities would would as the low sugar low carb low calorie space so a lot of that health conscious consumer uh, and that lifestyle aspect that we've touched on and that's sort of trending worldwide uh, and, and in the low to no alcohol space so um, similar uh, I suppose now you're seeing a lot of the zero percent alcohol options mm-hmm. so you can still enjoy that social occasion and, and not be not be the odd one out should we say a few years ago whereas now you're you're included in that in that social environment. Definitely, we're seeing a lot of that, and and obviously the research from com- uh, countries like the American hard seltzer market. So following along closely with, with what's happening over there and in Japan, here it's still an emerging market in this space, but we see a lot of uh, similarities with, with the the Western culture. So we're looking to uh, perhaps enter into that space as well. Ooh, exciting! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, often we ask crystal ball gazing questions. So I'd like to ask what's coming up for people to be aware of or that you're seeing personally, things that are coming up for you guys, your crystal ball gazing opportunity uh, has arisen. Has arisen. It's still cloudy, the ball, but <laughs> we are looking at essentially creating a range of flavours for Japan. We obviously have the apple and fee jar and the lemon and yuzu and kefir and lime going well, but trying to match the the seasonality as we've touched on is, is going to be really, really important for us. The supply chain for us in terms of an order to being on the shelf is around two and a half months. So we can only really attack a summer season three or four times um, a year in terms of orders and, and marketing. So we need to be able to have that seasonality change in our flavours well documented and, and well forecasted into the future. So we're in the process now of doing a lot of research and development around what is on trend in Japan and being uh, mainstream enough. 
but also um, what's what's next and what's coming, which Matt's touched on in terms of the low to no space, um, which we're investigating at the moment. Um, and that will also be useful in New Zealand, um, specifically for entering supermarkets. As a spirit-based brand, we can't at the moment uh, for New Zealand. So we're looking at finding another avenue to support consumers, to make an easy way to support conservation um, and looking at the non-alk space as well. And now that we're on day 19, a non-alk would be really, really great. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> All righty. So, yeah. Anything else you want to say before we start to wrap up today? Any good stories? Yeah, so I'd really encourage people to listen to Don's podcast with you both. His three points were really, really uh, impactful for us before we left, not just the business card side, but making sure that you are here in the market physically. Um, we obviously shot up here as soon as business visas were available, and, and that probably really helped cement the idea that we're actually investing in Japan and our distributors really sees us as taking this as a serious opportunity. I think his uh, other points are around expecting things to take some time and being here for the long haul, and that touches on that going out on the social occasions we've really cemented some good relationships we were speaking about you know for the next 30 years we will do this why well, new zealand mm-hmm. it's you know for the next three-year agreement yeah. or maybe just a one-year sponsorship agreement so really nice to see the longevity in the relationship once it's built yeah. um and i guess the last part is that we'll, we'll definitely be back uh, amazing to to be here but uh yeah, certainly we, we learned more in three weeks being here than we would have three years doing market research from New Zealand. Mm, so. mm. It'd be great if you can, <laughs> you can host some of your people in New Zealand too yes, in the future, right? right? Yeah, they so, would love that. Yeah, yeah we've we've utilised um, like the Kate Kidnappers golf course shot plenty of times and saying we will go for a round there and mm. um, we will definitely take them on. A, uh, golf seems a, a big interest, especially with our distributor. So go on a tour with that and really reciprocate the hospitality that's been shown. And a lot of people haven't traveled to New Zealand. So offering that opportunity to be hosted is, is really a tick in the right direction. Um, but yeah, certainly excited uh, yeah. to be back yeah. and we'll definitely reach out to you both again. And we can maybe do a dinner meeting instead of breakfast next time. I would do dinner. <laughs> yeah, No karaoke though. We don't really do the karaoke. Oh, no, we don't do it <laughs> I was on the golf course yesterday, guys. You'll be happy to know the Caledonian, oh, the Caledonian course, a little bit north of Tokyo. And my goodness, is it beautifully manicured? It's a fast course. I would love to take you both there when you come back. And so I think it would be a great course to do around with you oh, there. Yeah. So next time, yeah, mm-hmm. thank you. Maybe we can do another podcast, but we do it on the on the golf course. Yeah, live from the golf course. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. And so you've got a cup. I've got an activity or promotion that you'd like to let. Uh, our listeners know about the ones the Kiwis who are listening from New Zealand yeah so um, for New Zealand we have a Jandals 10 10 percent discount through our online store that we've set up today um, and we'll Yay. run that indefinitely so anyone who wants to try native is it also a mix six pack as well mm. might be the best way if you haven't tried native um, to try all the four flavors mm. that we do have uh, and then also in Japan um, we'll share some more details with you both possibly publishers is uh, we're working with transit group they have around 100 cafes and restaurants in their portfolio but we've secured an activation across five in five different areas of japan so we'll share that as well and, and share some dates around when they'll be um, and it'll be what we, we call it native nights um, so it'll be our first kind of series of native nights in new zealand and teaming up with the cookie time company as well to support them and yeah so that's going to be really fun for us to find kind of a- activate and show right. show how we activate when it comes from a New Zealand perspective. Sounds great. Wow. Yeah. Well, when you need some other natives there to help support you, well, <laughs> you know where to come to. <laughs> yeah, well, Thank definitely, you. you know, um, there's a couple in Tokyo as well. So close Oh, to that sounds great. Right. Wonderful. We're glad to hear you've got a collaboration amongst Kiwi companies as well, which is fantastic. Mm. Any last words, Guy and Matt? Really appreciate the conversation, the chance to come on today and appreciate it, obviously, meeting you both in Conrad Hotel in, in Tokyo and um, nice to chat again today and, and really look forward to touching base and, and keeping up with what you both are doing. Um, it's amazing that you're taking on the challenge of sharing the Kiwi story from Japan as well. So um, it's really, really cool to see and really supportive for brands like us who are, who are just starting out on our, on our journey. We love it and we're so glad that Don's podcast, that you said it was impactful to you before you left, has just made all of this thoroughly worthwhile for us mm. and from the bottom of our hearts really mm. mean that thank you so much mm. Great. well, well 
congratulations to both of you for being fabulously successful jandals in Japan. And thank you for telling us your story today. We've really enjoyed it, haven't we, Jane? We have. It's been a real highlight and we'll be following you from here on. Yeah. And come back soon. Come back soon. Awesome, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Wow, that was such a fun episode. I love talking to Matt and Guy. They are a couple of good guys. Aren't they? I mean, they're just so natural and fresh and sparkling, just like their product. Yeah. They're just <laughs> great. I mean, partway through that that recording, I had to remember I was actually having a recording and not yeah. having a chat with them. That's where I think it must be when they're with their customers. They're just so easy to talk with, right? You know how they said that they often talked about where they come from, who their family are, the story behind Native, the story behind Native, before Native, the story before, before Native. Mm. So those sorts of things that they talked about with their customers and suppliers and people that they met with, that was really important on the Japanese side. Not, of course, they probably needed to know the facts and figures as well, but that wasn't the key thing that was sitting there for the people that they were meeting with they wanted to know who these two guys were mm. can we trust really you lovely. yeah we trust you yeah mm. yeah are you a decent sort of person to be doing business with that's what people are looking for in addition to all the numbers exactly and, and I, yeah. that was really amazing how they had that idea of the showing the you know their farm and kicking the golf ball off the tee and how that meant such a lot to break the ice and was a real introduction to here's where we live we're off from a farm but we've mm. got a big a big amount of land that we do this on that land and just shows personality and lifestyle of new zealand mm. which i mm. think really sells their story in a, a really different way in a way that they probably never ever thought about it before they came to japan well, it was really lovely yeah i think they probably have a, a a wonderful new appreciation for new zealand now that they've been to japan for these couple of weeks and have yes. seen how their story has been received by japanese people and will know much better for next time what what kind of sort of things work and what's appreciated yeah, yeah. it's that sort of thing we take for granted in a way that it's our, what we are where we came from who we are right but it's actually very different to japan and that means a lot will hopefully mean a lot to them as well that they take it back that New Zealand is a fantastic place and they appreciate their home country even mm, more than they mm, did before. Mm. It's, a, it's yeah. interesting, isn't it? Gosh, so many things that they, they talked about. But yeah, mm. top tips from today's recording were? Well, I thought that was lovely that they said, please, you know, have a little talk to the Kiwis who are on the land here, who are living here such as you me don that they spoke with a few of those sorts of people like us who know a little bit about what it's like here and also have it through a kiwi lens i thought that was a really good mm. tip um the other one i mean obvious things to us but again the being on time being very aware of japanese customs uh business customs making sure we've got those business cards whoa don well done you for yes. suggesting that goodness me um and you know being prepared before you come here trying to find uh, resources, as I just said, with the, looking through the Kiwi lens with Kiwis here, but listening to the podcast, <laughs> listen to Jandals in Japan. Mm. Um, they listened to Don's podcast and got some really meaningful uh, facts and figures from what he told us with his tips. I thought that was a really lovely touch as well. Nice one. So glad to hear that we've had somebody. Yeah. <laughs> True. And uh, many more on the way, I'm sure. Yeah. And again, the last thing they probably said, which meant a lot, was that they learned a lot in three weeks here than mm. they could have learned in three years. And yeah. that really underlines how it takes a long time in Japan uh, and you have to be here for the long haul, but how much you can learn in a short time mm. if you come mm. here. Yep. So that was also a brilliant thing I took away from what they told us. Yeah. Yeah. And I think they have taken every opportunity that has presented itself along the way and really made the best use of their time here. If you've been following their Instagram stories you'll, and things, you'll see the, the things they've been up to. Amazing stuff. So well done. You guys have well done, really guys. done New Zealand proud in these last few weeks. You've very proud here. of you. Really proud of you. And I'm sure your mum and dad will be too. And Brooke, they'll all be very proud of you back there. Looking forward to seeing what you come up with with your new flavours mm. and the R&D you're doing on that. If you need some people to test anything, <laughs> you know who to give a shout out to. What flavour would you suggest Ooh, if they were going to do a new flavour for Japan? 
for potentially for next summer? What, I've got one idea. Oh, Mus- muscat grapes. Muscat grapes. The mm. typical Japanese grape, right? A grape mm. variety might be quite delicious. Right. I'm seeing a lot of kiwi fruit drinks around these days. So I'm thinking kiwi fruit is very much this year. Maybe for next year, a summer mm. flavor mint. Mint. <laughs> Like a mojito, but not. Or pear, you know, pears. We talked about pear, nashi, maybe using some of the nashi in there. I don't know, but it would be very interesting. Imagine mint, mint and what? Mojito. Like a mojito 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 flavor. Kind of like minty. A low cow, Mm. low carb mojito. Mojito style type Mm. hard seltzer thing. Mm. Well, you heard it here first. I would buy it. (laughs) Matt and Guy, you heard it here first. Well, so excited we were to couldn't wait for today and really really glad that we could get you on we really hope that everyone else is enjoying listening to jandals in japan and is subscribed because subscription is the way to make sure you don't miss out on an episode yeah make sure you're on our mailing list lots of goodies coming down the line for people who are on our mailing list and you'll get the the codes and things that you will need to take advantage of in this episode it's for the new zealanders but you can actually buy native sparkling online from what i've seen uh, from nakdan and things so if you're not in one of the main centers you can get it online so don't worry you can try it you can try it (laughs) thanks so much everyone okay see you next time Bye. bye thanks for listening make sure you check out our guests links in the show notes This podcast is brought to you today by Catherine O'Connell Law and Pod Launch with Jane. If you have a great story you think should be on the show, come and find us on LinkedIn or Instagram. We'd love to hear from you. See you next time. Matane!